The Chargers were heavily represented at LSU's Pro Day on Wednesday, presumably to watch one of the top cornerbacks in the draft class, Derek Stingley, and Brandon Staley was watching very closely. But are the Chargers actually willing to go up and get him because he's probably not going to be there at 17? You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Locked On Chargers podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade, joined as always by my co-host, David Drogemeyer. We've been covering the Chargers together for over six seasons, but this is our fifth season as the host of the Locked On Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. Thank you guys so much for making us your first listen today. And as always, to make sure you never miss the show, go subscribe to the Locked On Chargers YouTube channel and also follow the show for free on all platforms wherever you get your podcast from. But, David, we have news today because Brandon Staley and a couple other big defensive coaches were out at LSU's Pro Day, presumably to watch Derek Stingley, who is a divisive, I think, draft prospect, but a supremely talented one. And they were, you know, handling it pretty well and being very involved in that pro day, having him go through some drills and Brandon Staley giving him pointers. So we'll talk about what he would bring to the table as a draft prospect. We also wanted to start getting into some draft prospect profiles, maybe doing like one or show or something along those lines until the draft. So we can kick it off today with a guy it seems like they're very interested in. But we also have another big segment on today's show because we're also getting into who has improved the most because of the additions the Chargers have made in this offseason. Who got the most help? Is it Joey Bosa? Is it Derwin James? Where does Justin Herbert rank on that list? So we have all that to get into. But it starts, David, with Derek Stingley because throughout this pro day process, and there's still some big schools that haven't done it yet, we haven't seen the Chargers, you know, and specifically Brandon Staley out. So when you see him in the other coaches with him, in this case, defensive coordinator Ronaldo Hill and defensive backs coach Derek Ansley, you're like, okay, well, there's obviously some smoke here, more smoke than we've seen at least throughout the rest of this process because he's on the field. He's talking with Stingley. He's going through drills with Stingley and in Stingley's words, giving him, you know, some pointers in those drills. And he also said that they were out there to see if he still had it, basically, to see if he still had the determination and the power, as he put it, when he was talking to Brandon Staley. And he had an impressive performance, but that was just kind of out of nowhere, David, because now it's like, okay, well, you probably can't get him at 17, but you're out here as if you're maybe trying to draft him. Yeah, I mean, the wheels definitely start turning in your head. I mean, if you're the Chargers and if you're a Chargers fan, if you see your head coach and, you know, some very important defensive coaches out there at his pro day or at the LSU pro day, right, it's not just for him. But, I mean, obviously, he's one of the big pieces there at at LSU in this draft. And presumably, I mean, at least for everything that we've heard, this is a guy that's probably looking at going in the top 10. So for the for the Chargers, I mean, to to be so heavily represented at the pro day definitely makes you think a little bit about, hey, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the draft, right? It's always uh, the biggest crapshoot. It's, uh, you know, it's Vegas's favorite time because you just never know what's going to happen. And hey, if he is by some miracle there at 17, the Chargers at least getting a very close look at him and getting all the homework and also being able to take this moment and to speak to him directly and really try to get an understanding of who he is and really see if he fits with the team. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's not just how many coaches they had there, right? It's which coaches you brought your defensive backs coach, you brought your defensive coordinator means you're probably not going after, you know, one of the interior offensive line that they have or linemen entering the draft that they have. And also, when you think about it, I mean, this would also be a crazy, funny smoke screen if this was all to try to get, you know, Neil Farrell Jr., right, or somebody totally unrelated at LSU. It's like, we'll bring Derek Ansley, we'll bring Ronaldo Hill, you know what I mean? And But really, we're just going after this defensive Psych. lineman. We actually don't want Derek Stingley at all. But it was interesting, specifically from the point that you were talking about, if he's probably not going to be there. And the, it's taking him at 17, obviously, would be a very, you know, Interesting decision, depending on who's on the board, but a guy that, yeah, could easily go in the top 10, a guy that's easily seen as one of the top prospects with a couple of red flags. But like at the end of the day, David, if you really want to get this guy, you'd have to trade up to get him, which is a different conversation. Oh, a a different conversation entirely, especially with a player. You're talking about those red flags. Obviously, one of those biggest red flags is just the injury history. I mean, he's coming off a surgery. That's definitely something that you have to really think about, but also something that could cause him to fall a little bit in the draft. 
if those teams have some serious concerns about the medicals or if he's going to be able to recover and be that same type of player that they saw at LSU. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. But I mean, if everything checks out, yeah, the Chargers are going to have to move up and there's no way to be able to get him if you don't. So uh, you're going to have to probably dip into, you know, draft capital. You don't really have any other top 100 picks and this, you know, other than your third round pick. Um, and I don't know if that's going to be enough to swing a deal to go from 17 to, you know, 10 or 11 or wherever, wherever he's gonna it's going to go. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Wherever, whatever you're going to have to get to, to go get him. And I think that's the thing is, yeah. I mean, Derwin James slid, obviously there are the red flags there. I think the other red flags are, you really only saw the one truly dominant season in 2019. And that was a couple of years ago. Like obviously when you see the slate of receivers that he had to play and how he was faring against those dudes as a freshman, right on a championship run with Joe Burrow and the rest of that LSU Tigers team, that's pretty impressive. And you've seen him do it. So that's the thing. You know, you're not, it's not really a projection with him. Like if you're doing this, you're projecting him getting back to a level he's already been at because the talent there is an undeniable thing as well because the athleticism checks out. The ball skills in that five interception season checked out. The slate of receivers and the guys you've got to see him go against really checks out. But we also talked about the red flags as well. But I think if he is there, David, and with all the things he does bring to the table, it would be a pretty intriguing prospect to pass up on if they did. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, one of the things that stuck out to me right away when I was watching his tape is – this guy's got insane closing speed. When he decides and he diagnoses a play correctly and he attacks, he explodes through the ball carrier. I mean, I think a great example of that when I was watching the Central Michigan game, there was a quick pass out to the wide receiver. He read it instantly and he exploded through the receiver, caused a forced fumble a fumble that he actually was able to recover. And that was an, a phenomenal example of when he sets his mind to it, he sees it correctly and he reads and reacts. He can really make some special plays. Also like the uh, the fact that he was pretty good as the last line of defense type of defender. They put him in the middle as a free safety a couple of different times. And, you know, he made a really, really good tackle against Mizzou in that situation. I really like that aspect of his game as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the tackling is a is a different conversation because that's definitely one of the bigger you yes. know, cons with him is just you've seen him have some incredible open field tackles. And you're like, yeah, give me yeah. that, you know, inject yeah. that in my veins. Right. And then there's other times, you know, where he's trying to shoulder check dudes and he's not wrapping up and something like that. Obviously, you're drafting a dude for the coverage skills like that sure. because it's incredible. You know, the way he's patient at the line of scrimmage, the way he pins receivers to the boundary when he's outside, just really limiting what they're able to do there and always seems to get hands on dudes and reroute them. Like he yeah. does so many things incredibly well and has done them at a, such a high level, an all-American level mm-hmm. as a freshman. And you've seen that. But it's obviously you have to take all that with a grain of salt. I would say one thing that checks out, obviously, with his pro day that he showed off was like, hey, if he's running a you know four 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 with the official time from his forty and getting that kind of explosiveness with his vertical and his broad jump, he seems to be coming back from those injuries pretty well. But yeah, I mean, an injury in twenty twenty that kept him out of seven or kept him to only playing seven games, and he only ended up playing three games in twenty twenty one. That's a concern, especially with the Chargers' history of those type of players, and especially when you're talking about your first pick in the first round when your next pick doesn't come till the third round. So it's easy to get excited about it, and the thing is, is like if they picked him right, you could see the argument. You could see why you'd be excited about it, but it doesn't mean there's obviously not some drawbacks, which would be the only reason he gets to you to begin with. But this offseason has been crazy, and we've seen crazier things than you know Tom Telesco potentially trading up to get him, and it would be in line with the aggressiveness that we've seen from him so far. But who on the Chargers already benefited the most from the Chargers move? Who got the most help this offseason? To me, David, it's between Joey Bosa and Derwin James, and both of them did get a lot of help in this offseason. But if the Chargers want to add Derek Stingley into the mix with J.C. Jackson, Khalil Mack, and the rest of those guys, they may be making a pretty serious bet that he's going to continue to stay healthy, just like he got you know, Derwin James healthy and some of the other guys who had lingering injury histories. But when I make all my risky bets, I'm doing it with BetOnline.net because they are official betting sponsor of the Locked On Chargers podcast. And BetOnline is your number one source for all of your betting leads and, sport and, need and sports info. Make sure you guys find all the latest sports developments, including this week's Masters Championships. That starts today, guys, and that's something I'm going to be watching closely, especially in golf where, like, if you hit – the golfer that wins the whole thing. If you can bet the golfer that wins the green jacket, you're going to win in a big way. And what Bet Online does is they keep it fun. They have so many tournaments and things going on where it's not just betting, you know, and doing an over under or something like that. They make it so much more interesting. They give you chances with live in game betting to change your fate 
And it's also a lot of fun to bet on UFC. And UFC has a giant fight card this weekend that I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to. And it's going to be even better when the guy that I don't know knocks somebody out winning me a bunch of money. But make sure you guys head to the website or use your mobile device today to learn more about the trends and the action at Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, David. Well, we talked about our draft prospect profile for Derek Stingley, a very interesting and polarizing player, to be sure. But now it's time to talk about the Chargers and the guys that they already have. And hey, you know, when you have an offseason like this, it's so fun to think about all the different ways that these teams can use these players, right? And and how the new additions that you have are going to help the guys that you already had, especially when it seems pretty clear cut, you know, how some of these guys are going to make the guys already on the Chargers better already. I mean, even without having seen them play it down just from what they've already done in their NFL career so far. But when you're trying to keep up with everything going around the NFL, it can be hard. So I make sure I always listen to the Locked On NFL podcast as well. If you guys need a second listen so you can keep up to date with everything going around the league, everything going on. So, David, with this conversation, I think it's a fun one because the Chargers did most of it on the the de- you know the defensive side of things. When you bring in Khalil Mack, when you bring in J.C. Jackson, like you're making a statement, we're trying to fix this defense. But there's a couple of guys the Chargers already had, a couple of star players, a couple of all-pro level players, and Joey Bosa and Derwin James. And I think when you're looking at who benefits the most from what the Chargers got this offseason, Maybe there's an argument for Justin Herbert just for not having to put the entire team on his back, and we'll get into that in the next segment. But I think it comes down to Derwin James or Joey Bosa. So if you're thinking about who got the most help, you know, which star, you know, Brandon Staley and Tom Telesco armed with the most weapons around him, who would you go with? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's Joey Bosa, and and there's a very simple reason why, and I'm going to take you back kind of through memory lane here. He was drafted back in 2016, right? And so his running mates – in 2016, his rookie year, he had 10 and a half sacks. Melvin Ingram, which was the next leading person, had eight. In 2017, which was the only year in his six-year career where he's had any defender have over 10 sacks in a season as well as he did. So 12 and a half sacks for him in 17, 10 and a half for Melvin Ingram. In 2018, it was seven sacks and 16 games for Melvin Ingram. Five and a half and seven games for Joey Bosa in 18 and 19. It was 11 and a half and seven in 2020. That's when it switched to Uchin and Wilsu. Seven and a half sacks and 12 games for Joey. Four and a half sacks for Uchin and Wilsu. And in, in 2021, 10 and a half sacks for Joey. Only five sacks for Uchin and Wilsu. So now you bring in a guy like Khalil Mack, who is a destroyer. I mean, six of eight seasons played 16 games. Four seasons of 10-plus sacks and a couple of 14, 15-sack seasons mixed in there as well. He is an absolute force. And obviously, the biggest benefit in the world here for Joey Bosa is you can't double-team him anymore. Now there's a legitimate threat on the other side that can stop the run and absolutely terrorize your quarterback. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's a big part of it, obviously. And this is easily the best player he's ever played across from. And really, the only time a player has been on his level, right? A a guy of his back, dude, even with Melvin Ingram there, I think Joey Bosa got Melvin Ingram more one-on-one situations than Melvin Ingram got Joey Bosa one-on-one situations, right? But you're only mentioning Cleo Mack. You're not talking about the rest of the guys on there, right? Because I also think that Joey Bosa really benefits in the run game with guys like Sebastian Joseph Day and Austin Johnson next to him, guys he knows are going to follow their assignment. And, you know, at least get running backs to slow down without getting, you know, pushed two yards past the line of scrimmage. So, like, having other dudes who are going to be competitive and fighting to hold the point of attack is going to really help him. And having J.C. Jackson is going to help him a hell of a lot as well, David, because the thing is, is, yeah, J.C. Jackson helps Derwin James, and we'll talk about that. But what he does for Joey Bosa is he's going to take their best receiver and maybe give you that extra second to get yeah. home, right? Because yeah. that's been one of the biggest things Being with sticky. Joey is just – Teams game plan around it. They throw quickly. They do all of these things to try yeah, to you know, chip offset. them and they do everything, right? Of course. Yeah. But now when you have somebody out there that's going to maybe take away their best receiver for an extra second, that makes all the difference in the world. That's the, you know, oh, yeah. a pass rusher trying to get hits and trying to affect the quarterback. How many you almost just... sacks have we seen from Joey Bosa the last several years? Of I mean, course. you got somebody on the back end who can take away that number one guy like – he can get there. I mean, he can stay sticky. J.C. Jackson does a phenomenal job of staying fluid with that receiver. Yeah, and I mean, the more guys you have like that in the secondary, which is why the Derek Stingway you know, pick would make sense, is like the better it's going to be for your pass rush. So if you have that guy, I mean, the second is such a long time in the NFL, especially for yeah. a quarterback to decide where they're going to want to go. If you can make him pump fake one time, right, that could be all it takes 
before Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack are closing in on that dude. But that's not to say that Derwin James isn't a very close second to that, David, because you would say the same thing with J.C. Jackson is I think the biggest thing for me is Derwin James doesn't have to try to support as many other players when you have a player like J.C. Jackson taking Seriously. away potentially the best receiver, right? Because I think last year it didn't always happen. You saw them unleash him as a, you know, down, you know, downhill threat and things like that and be aggressive with him at times. Yeah, But I think a lot of the reason they couldn't do that more often was because it's like they had to have him back there because they couldn't really trust the other dudes, especially when it was like Tavon Campbell and Chris Harris Jr. out there as two of your main corners. You have to give them some help with Derwin James. I think now he is more free to, to be the, you know, put in the positions that he can be the most effective, especially being more aggressive with him. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things I had in my notes is, I mean, having JC Jackson on one side, potentially taking away that number one receiver that frees up Derwin James to play in the slot. He can play against the tight end. You know, if you got a Travis Kelsey out there, you got to stop. You can rush him, you know, rush the passer. Basically, it's whatever Brandon Staley can concoct. He can turn into his mad scientist and really put Mm -hmm. Derwin James where he thinks the action is going to be. That's what he did with Jalen Ramsey. That's what he's going to be able to do with J.C. Jackson and with Derwin James. This just allows Derwin James to focus on different things, maybe less things, maybe take some things off of his plate so he can do whatever the other tasks that he's being asked to do at a much higher level. Well, I I ask you this, David. This is the question I have for you. Who's going to block a blitzing Derwin James if you also have to block Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa? Oh, my goodness. I do not know the answer to that, and that is going to be a question that is going to keep a lot of offensive coordinators up at night just crying, praying that they can figure out a way because you can't chip everyone. You know, like I said, but you, you have to pick your poison, and especially if it's not only Joey Bosa, not only Khalil Mack, it's Derwin James who is an animal as a pass rusher. Like he is relentless. He's way stronger than he looks. He is very, he's obviously very quick and he's, it's like a developed pass rusher. That's yeah. what's so scary about his game. There's not one thing that you can point to and say that is not an above average skill because Derwin James does all of it at a high level. So imagining that kind of, I mean, what kind of package would that, you know, what's the name for that? You know, sending Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack and Derwin James all at the quarterback. That's just a, a terrifying sight. Yeah, scary hours for sure. I mean, yes, Derwin James is such a great player already. I think we're going to see an even better version of him, you know, as long as he can go through the whole offseason healthy. Coming yeah. back from a season he got through, you know, healthy for the most part for sure. I mean, that yeah. was his kind of comeback season after two years of being derailed by big-time injuries. Now he had a full, pretty much fully healthy season under his belt, heading in and having all the momentum that he has going into 2022. It's going to be very, very scary. And I think the other thing, too, is him and how he's going to be helped by Austin Johnson, Sebastian Joseph Day, and Coolio Mack from a running standpoint. Because, yes, like just like you know, Jason Jackson makes the quarterback hold the ball for an extra second. Yeah. With the defensive front that you have now, there's a chance that running backs now have to wait another second. The, the holes aren't quite as developed as they once were because they're being held. There's not huge gaps to run through. And when you're giving Derwin James an extra second when he's getting downhill to make tackles in the running game, the dude already gets downhill like no other player in the NFL. So now you're holding up those running backs, right, and freeing him up for more tackles at behind the line of scrimmage potentially. That's another bonus for Derwin James that I don't think a lot of people are talking about. Well, I think that's an excellent point, Daniel, but also I'd like to bring up the fact that I think this is going to cause not only more interceptions for J.C. Jackson, but I think this is more opportunities for interceptions for Derwin James and for Nazir Adderley and for Asante Samuel Jr. The Khalil Mack, yeah. Khalil Mack effect. I mean, when you have less— Khalil Mack is going to get more hurries means more rush throws, right? More rush throws means more interceptions for Derwin James. Exactly, which the Chargers did not have nearly enough interceptions or turnovers last year. So improving the pass rush and improving the coverage are two ways that are going to absolutely positively impact that metric. And as important as it is to help those two guys, right? There's still no question about who the most important player on the team is, and that's Justin Herbert. And that's the big question is you helped him his first year in the offseason going into his second season, but did you help him enough this year, right? You brought in Gerald Everett, and I'm a big fan of that and an advocate for that move for sure, but you also didn't do much with the offensive line. But the great news is, David, there's still time, and we'll talk about all of that coming up right after this. All right, David, well, we talked about the two players who benefited the most from, you know, adding guys like Khalil Mack and J.C. Jackson and the dogs they added on the defensive line. But Justin Herbert wasn't in that conversation. And 
you could argue that going into every offseason, you're trying to do the most to help Justin, Justin Herbert over anyone else, right? It's like, yeah. hey, how do I get more out of Justin Herbert? And that hasn't been the approach so far. And, and I say so far just because, yeah, there it, we could feel differently about this conversation specifically as we head into the season. Because, like, with Derwin James, for example, like they could add more defensive acts for him in the draft, which is going to keep helping him, right, and, and make yeah. that conversation even a little bit different. Because sure. he, he does need some help at safety if he wants to be all these places we want him to be, right? But yeah, with Justin Herbert, you cut Brian Bulaga. That's not a loss because he wasn't playing, right? No. You haven't brought back Ode Ibushi. That is still kind of a loss at this point, but at the, he's still a potentially an option. And you have the draft upcoming. So I do think when you're looking at this conversation, you still have to reserve a little bit of judgment. No question about it. Yeah, because it's an incomplete product. And we don't you know, we don't know what the team is going to look like right now because it's going to still change very, very drastically. The Chargers have 10 picks in this year's draft. So there's a lot of draft capital, but also I, I think I want to bring things back to, to the defense a little bit and how that's going to benefit Justin Herbert a lot too. And the reason for that is in 2020, the chargers defense allowed 4.5 yards per carry 119 yards per game. They could not get off the field. They were 20 also 23rd in points per game allowed at 26.6. Oh, and in 2021, it got a lot worse. The defense allowed 4.6 yards per carry, and they were 30th in rush yards allowed, 138.8 rush yards per game, but 29th in the league in points per game, allowing 27 points per game, which was worse than the Jaguars and the Texans, two teams that were two of the worst in the league. So the reason why an improved defense is going to help Justin Herbert is because he's not going to have to be asked to go out there and put up 35 points and throw for 450 yards like Brandon Staley said. So... Taking up, taking some of that off of his plate, you're going to be able to see a better version of Justin Herbert, who's not going to have to be Superman and do it all. That and that's something that you know Brandon Zaley talks specifically about, right? Just saying, like, hey, we want to not make this guy have to go put up 35 points every yeah. single week, as he put it, <laughs> right? Yeah. And that is a huge benefit to him. Not to mention the fact that you're getting him the ball more, right? You're, yes, you literally should be taking the ball away way more than you have because you got Mr. INT and JC Jackson. You should have a much better pass rush in 2022, which should all boost those numbers to go along with a strong emphasis last year enforcing fumbles. And now, yeah, yeah. you know, the last time, the last season under Brandon Staley for, you know, Joey Bosa led the league in strip sacks. The last time that Khalil Mack was with Brandon Staley, he had over six strip sacks that season as well. So, it. I mean, that's something that they already good at. They just didn't have enough guys taking the ball away and they weren't putting themselves in enough positions. But this is a Justin Herbert conversation. So if you're getting him more opportunities with the ball and you're able to close the leads that he does have, that's yeah. going to be a game changer for the Chargers. It helps you in one score situations. So when Justin Herbert with two minutes left scores a go ahead touchdown in Kansas City, you at least feel like you have a chance to get a sack here, to have a ball be intercepted or something like that, to give you a chance to close out the game and getting those closers to not put Justin Herbert's efforts to waste, right? Because that was that's yes. just terrible. You get a go-ahead touchdown, two minutes left, and then you end up giving it up. There's nothing worse than that. And that's definitely going to help Justin Herbert. I think if I'm playing devil, devil's advocate with that specific conversation, though, I would say that – so you're not – that helps you in some way, but it doesn't necessarily help you offensively, right? Sure. That, that by itself doesn't help you offensively. You're just hoping, hey, if I can get the same offense – right, and have a much better defense, that makes us a much better team. And that's true in a vacuum, right? But maybe there should be more of an emphasis of actually improving the offensive well. And I think they did that with Gerald Everett. That's the yeah. one thing where, like, okay, we went and got Justin Herbert a new toy. And yes. we talked with that, you know, with, with Daniel Popper about that yesterday. I do think that is a very big upgrade over what they had last year in Jared Cook. I completely agree. I mean, because you got a, a younger player that is very explosive in the open field. And hey, you're adding another weapon with not adding a huge contract either. I mean, and it also just goes in line with, you know, the kind of the mantra of getting younger players that can be able to sit here and build with the, the program and build with the quarterback. Because, hey, this might be an audition for Gerald Everett. Say, hey, you know, you go out there and perform well these you know two years that we signed you. That could turn into a long term relationship where you're going to be able to grow for five or six years with the Chargers with or someone else, though, too, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it's all not, he can get paid by anybody, and the Chargers are all about that, supposedly, right? 
<laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, Obviously, I mean, they hope it works out with the Chargers, right? Right. Um, but adding another weapon for Justin Herbert, a guy where you can get the ball out of his hands quickly, and that guy can go out there and make things happen, make a and play. turn yeah. those three, you know, two or three yard plays that we saw last year into those seven, eight, nine, ten plus yard plays. Hopefully, next year with Justin Herbert. And you have now another young athletic tight end to pair with Donald Parham, right? Yes. And a, another guy to pair with Trey McKitty. Maybe that gives you more opportunities to run double tight end formations and things like that because yes. you can run a lot of fun looking stuff out of that. And it gives you some advantages offensively to help with pass rush, which you still kind of need with those, you know, positions you're needing on the offensive line and things like that. You have now Donald Parham and Gerald Everett running at the same time through a secondary. And we know how much Justin Herbert has loved targeting his tight ends through two years. You're giving him a younger, more explosive option. A guy who does more after the catch. And I think needed experience into that room as well, instead of just trying to roll into the season with Parham and Trey McKitty, another young tight end. But at the same time, I mean, you still need to do something in the draft at this point. Oh, right? yeah. If we're assuming that the big moves in free agency are done at this point, we also have to hope that the Chargers are planning on still trying to heavily invest in help for Justin Herbert in the draft, whether that come in the form of a speedy wide receiver, whether that come in the form of a very talented running back, because that's another thing that really helps quarterbacks save is a talented running game. Obviously sure. gives you more options and, you know, offensive line help because you still have pretty big holes either at guard or at tackle or potentially both. Yeah, I mean, we do know just based off of what Brandon Staley said that their plan on addressing the running back position is that they want to go get a young guy in the draft. So hopefully, you know, this is the third time's a charm here, right? You know, they the last <laughs> couple of years, they have went out there and drafted running back. So uh, hopefully they can find one that sticks that can actually spell Austin Eckler and be able to grind out those games when you're in those situations to where you want to put the game away. I mean, you need that type of player that's going to be able to do that. And, yeah, the big thing is the offensive line. They just need to add bodies to that unit and hopefully capable bodies that will be able to protect Justin Herbert and also give you some depth, some much-needed depth for that unit. I mean, I think, yeah, you do actually need bodies because there's not enough dudes, right, in that room as of right now. There's just not enough players there. But, like, you need more talent, too, because oh, yeah. right now there's two positions, one with Brendan Hymas potentially filling in at right guard if – Filer stays a left guard where you don't really know what that's going to look like yet. And at right tackle, the problem isn't you don't have bodies at that position. The problem is, is the two bodies you do have there, you don't trust with Trey Pipkins and Storm Norton. And they could also, you know, go get a receiver to help Justin Herbert as well. We'll see if they try to address the tight end position in the draft too. But I think those are all ways the Chargers could help Justin Herbert even more. And I do think They've done a lot to make their team the most complete team. It hasn't seemed like it's as singularly focused as it was last year on protecting Justin Herbert when, you know, the first question of Staley walking into the interview room was, hey, I know you're a defensive coach. How are you going to keep Justin Herbert getting better? How are you trying to do this? And that right now, yes, you helped on defense, but you're trying to make Justin Herbert get better. I think he's going to get better just being two seasons, the same offense. All those things are going to make him better on his own. But are you giving him the maximum amount of weapons, the maximum amount of help offensively, not defensively, to be a much better version than he was last season or to at least maximize what you do have in him? And I think that's still a fair question as we enter the draft season. But as Daniel Popper said, David, this is the most complete they've been entering a draft. Even though the needs are apparent, the rest of the talent, especially on the defensive side and what you know you already have in talent on the offensive side, they're in a very, very good spot, even with those kind of glaring holes. But that is going to wrap things up for today's show. The good news is tomorrow you guys get involved because it is fan mail Friday. So you guys can call into the Locked On Chargers voicemail line at 323-524-7924 if you guys want to leave a voicemail. We'll also be putting a post out on our Twitter at Locked On LAC where you guys can get your questions. And you can even put your questions in the YouTube comments. We're not picky. Put them wherever you want. We'll try to get them on tomorrow's show. If you do leave a voicemail, try to keep it around 30 to 45 seconds. That makes it the most likely to get onto the show. But we'll also be posting and retweeting things from our personal account. So you can follow me on Twitter at Dan Talk Sports and David Drogemeyer on Twitter at Drotalk SD. You can also find the show every day by making sure that you subscribe to the Locked On Chargers YouTube channel and also following the show for free on all platforms wherever you get your podcast from. And if you like the show, please rate and review. It means a lot to us when we get those in. Definitely keeps us going, especially in the off-season grind content machine kind of days that we're in right now. So we appreciate all of your guys' support. As always, you can also find our at Locked On Chargers Instagram page and our Locked On Chargers Facebook page. But make sure you guys are back here tomorrow for Fan Mail Friday. Get involved. 
Let's put together a good show. We'll be back with you then. Until then, take it easy and go Bolts.